Good evening and welcome. I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, one of the pastors here at St. Philip to Deacon, and on behalf of St. Philip to Deacon and Mount Olivet of Plymouth, which jointly present the Faith and Life Lecture Series, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you tonight. Thank you for coming out on a cold evening. Um, if you've followed our series over the last nine years, you know that we have intentionally cast a broad net in terms of the kinds of speakers and topics that we get. Uh, so I'm a little surprised, actually, that in nine years we have never yet had an athlete come and speak. And uh, those of you who go to St. Philip and heard me teeing this up, I totally didn't plan to say that, I promise you. <laughs> um, have heard me say that it will not surprise you if you know me that the first athlete that we have is a golfer because I do indeed love to golf. So there are, that's one thing that's different about tonight is we have an athlete talking about <clears throat> her life as a professional athlete. The other thing that's different that we have never done before either is tonight, and if you notice the title, it says Faith and Golf, a conversation about the LPGA and the US Open. And that's intentional because this is the first time ever that we're gonna do our presentation as a conversation or a discussion. So tonight I will be playing the role of Charlie Rose <clears throat> and I will be lobbing softball questions to our honored guest, and uh, we'll see how that goes. I think it'll actually be fascinating. She and I have met a number of times, and the way we've planned this is basically said, you know, let's, let's talk about, or let's present it as if we're having a cup of coffee and just letting people listen in on our conversation. Tonight's speaker, uh, many of you know her. I'm sure she's a local uh, girl from Edina who uh, joined the tour and ended up being the first person ever to win the US Open by qualifying through local regionals. That was in 2003. In 2008, she was awarded the William and Mousy, is that right? Powell Award, which is given, as it says in her bio, to an LPGA member who, by her behavior and deeds, best exemplifies the spirits, ideals, and values of the LPGA. Uh, I asked her, as I ask all of our speakers, if she has anything in her bio that's sort of out of the ordinary, and she couldn't think of much other than she said, now that I have two daughters, I'm finding it's hard to do just about anything that I really love to do, <laughs> including golf. Will you please help me welcome Hillary Lunke. So this is weird, because now I actually have to think. I usually get to go just sit down and do nothing. Um, so the first question, Hillary, is can you help me with my putting? <laughs> you no, didn't I'm seem kidding. like you need any help. You were better than me the you whole know. time we played together. You probably don't even believe I'm a professional golfer at this point, the way I played the day we played together. <laughs> so we, were gonna, we weren't sure we were going to bring this up, but as long as she opened the door, uh, when, when Hillary and I were in conversation planning for this, this event, uh, she suggested that we do this conversation style, which I thought, you know, we've thought about doing that in the past, and I thought, fabulous, let's do that. So I said, we can either have a cup of coffee uh, and talk, uh, to get to know each other that way, or even better, we could play a round of golf. And she took me up on that, so we played around. I do golf. and. Um, <laughs> I was really nervous, honestly. I've never played with a U.S. Open champion. That may surprise you. <laughs> and her husband, Tyler, over there, uh, say hello to Tyler, who was on her bag, by the way, at the Open, also played for Stanford, and he joined us. So I'm, I'm on the first tee thinking, I'm playing with a couple of people who played on the Stanford golf team and someone who won the U.S. Open. I have never played better in my <laughs> life. I'm not kidding. It's Thank true. you. <laughs> And then we got rained out after yep. what, like six holes or something? Right, that's anyway. what always happens. No, it was. <laughs> You're it, playing it, your best. <laughs> that's right. We had a ton of fun. Um, so what we're going to do, and you know this, although we haven't really scripted this, what we're going to do tonight is sort of let Hillary tell her story leading up to the U.S. Open. But I, I asked her if she would just reflect on the front end a little bit about the title, Faith and Golf. And hopefully we'll we'll talk about that throughout the evening. But could you just say a few words about how you think? In your mind, faith and golf are connected? Yeah, um, well, I don't think they're particularly connected in any important way, um, you know, beyond any other arena of life. It's not like I'm going to tell you, you all need to take up golf because it's the key to your faith. You know, there's no <coughs> real connection. Um, other than I think what you wrote, I was reading it as I was sitting over there on the front of the, um, the bulletin for this evening. 
Um, golf is a sport where really in particular you have to be completely present at the moment. You can't think about the past, you can't think about the future. And I think that that is something in my faith that has been very important. Um, not dwelling on mistakes in the past, not dwelling on these great things I'm going to do in the future, but just taking each moment that God gives me and that's really all that we have. Um, and, and living in that moment and being present in that moment. Um, and the other thing is that they're both a grind. Mm. They're both hard. I mean, anyone who plays golf will tell you it is not an easy sport. It's not a sport where you just wake up every day and it just comes easy, even as a professional. Um, and the same is true with faith. It's not like you accept Christ and then just everything is smooth sailing and, you know, your life changes, but at the same time, um, it's a grind. It requires perseverance and it requires daily you know, a decision, a devotion um, to continue with it. And I think golf is a sport that really drives home that discipline. Okay, good. So talk about your early years. You grew up in Edina. Talk about your sort of early experience with golf. Or Yeah, I, um, I grew up around golf. My dad uh, played for the U and has always but just been a lifelong lover of golf. Um, so I grew up, you know, kind of on the golf course with him, watching him play, but I was into a bunch of other sports. I was really into softball, tennis, swimming was my big sport. I wanted to go um, to college on a swimming scholarship. I wanted to go to the Olympics. That was my, my big deal with swimming, and so golf just kind of was never really on the forefront of my mind. I used to caddy for my dad, and that's kind of what started to get me into it a little bit, is that um, I would watch it on TV with him, and I would caddy for him, and I started thinking, oh, maybe I could, maybe I could play. Um, and so I was in junior golf here and there, but never really played it as a sport until I was 13. In fact, um, at, when I first started high school, we were living in Arizona at the time, and swimming and golf were the same season there in the fall, and I chose swimming. So that'll just tell you, even as late as high school, um, golf was really not uh, on my radar screen. In sophomore year, uh, I decided, well, the, there was one kind of barrier to entry, and that was because they didn't have a girls' team in Arizona, so I would have had to try out for the boys team, so I had to really want to do it. <laughs> so it was easier to choose swimming um, my freshman year, but my sophomore year I went ahead and tried out for the boys team and made it, and uh, at the same time I was trying to swim, and my swimming coach said to me, what are you doing taking up a new sport? At the same time, you know, you tell me you wanna, you're committed to swimming and you want to do this, um, you know, how can you be taking up a new sport? And I had just kind of reached my end with swimming, I thought, I'd been swimming competitively for a number of years at that point, staring at the bottom of the pool, <laughs> you know, across you know, different cities and states when I would compete, and um, golf had just kind of bit me at that point. It wasn't, anyone who plays here will know kind of when you first start how you have that bug where you just want to keep playing and playing and playing, and that's all you want to do, and I was kind of at that point with golf, so I said, I guess I'm done with swimming and I'm just going to focus on golf and see what happens, which it was a pretty big decision at that point because I had really just taken up the sport and um, wasn't really very good. Um, but I liked, th liked it so much that I thought, even if nothing comes of this, I'm going to choose this right now because I'd rather play this sport for the rest of my life and enjoy being outside and seeing different golf courses than to stare at the bottom of the pool anymore. I was <laughs> over it. So. <laughs> and did you take lessons from your dad then? Or? Yeah, he was my, I guess, primary instructor. He's not a pro, um, but he he's you know, good with the game. And he had a great friend um, local here named Ron Benson, actually, who um, probably was my main instructor uh, until I got to college. And I started dabbling with some other instructors as well. But he was just a, a friend of my dad's, a great player himself. And he was the one that really taught me. Okay. And then you ended up going to Stanford, right? So is, am I skipping something nope. before Stan no, Stanford? No, that's good. Up? Yeah. Okay. So we, we uh, we moved back here in the middle of high school, and um, I was able to play on a girls' team at Edina High School, and we won the state championship. And uh, you had obviously become better by then. Yes, I had become, <laughs> <laughs> become better by then. I think <clears throat> the first round I played, I shot 124, um, which people tell me is good, and I would tell anyone that if that's your first round, that is pretty good. Um, but by the end of that summer, I had shot 89. And um, shortly after that, I shot 79. And I remember my dad saying, it's going to be a long time until you shoot 69. And I, I think within 18 months of when I started playing golf, I had shot 69. So um, yeah, it was good at it pretty wow. fast. I think just being around. Let's just pause and enjoy that sigh for a moment. <laughs> I still haven't gotten 59. Um, still waiting on that one. That, was the, that one wow. I'm still waiting on. But. Yeah, so it had gotten better, but um, still honestly didn't really know if I was going to get a college scholarship. I was so late to the game. You know, now these days, any of you who have children who play golf know 
It's like you gotta be in certain tournaments and you have to have a certain record by a certain age or these coaches aren't gonna look at you. And um, so I was sort of just trying to get in these tournaments that I could to kind of show my record. I was really just at that point still a local, um, you know, good player in Minnesota, but I hadn't done a lot nationally. So I um, was still uncertain whether or not I was gonna be able to earn a, a college scholarship. So I had sent my resumes every which direction across the country. I mean, I can't even tell you the number of schools I, I sent my applications to, but um, had a great, great year, kind of my junior year, your key year for getting a scholarship and, and was able to go to Stanford, which was a dream. Mm. So I, I assume you were the best player then in Edina by, by your junior year, or not that it matters? Well, but. interestingly enough, kind of. Um, and a kind of a, I think a real reason why I was able to turn into the kind of player that I was able to turn into was I had a teammate who ended up going on a full ride scholarship to Duke. Um, she was one of the top players in the country as well. So to have two of us on the same high school team um, kind of battling it, and we're, we're great friends. She's one of my best friends to this day. Her name's Kaylin Anderson. Um, but she and I kind of battling it out, you know, week to week, who's going to be number one or number two on, just on our high school team. Um, it was a great kind of push for each other. Nice. And by the way, I'm going to guess we have some high school golfers out there, right? Raise your hands if you're... Do we? Yes? Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> All right. We, we'll have some time for question and answers later, so I do hope that you'll uh, step up to the mic and ask some questions about your own games, okay? Uh, you still have a little time. <laughs> um, so anyway, so back to Stanford. So talk yeah. about that. Um, I had a great experience there. Um, at the time, the Pac-10 was probably the best um, golf conference, um, and just felt at home there when I took, it was the last of the recruiting trips that I took. Like I said, I had gone to Ohio State, North Carolina. I was all over the country um, checking things out and really didn't have a plan on, you know, one place I'd wanted to go. But when I went to Stanford, um, it just it just felt right. Um, I have always pursued academics as well, so it was just a, a good fit for me. And I had a great experience there. We ended up having a, a, a really good team three, I was one of three freshmen to come in that year, so the whole team kind of transformed. Um, and it was just a, a fun group of girls and mm -hmm. one of the best times of my life, for sure. So, and for those of us who have not played Big Ten sports, uh, which includes me, talk <clears throat> a little, what was it like to be on a Big Ten team in golf? I mean, what does it entail? Uh, how many tournaments are you playing? How many people are on the team? Pac-10, but yes. Yeah, right, excuse me, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, Well, for excuse girls, me. it's um, six, there's five scores count, six people travel, um, usually for the most part. And um, so it's a pretty intimate group, really, um, in terms of the scholarships. Most often in, in women's golf, full scholarships are given versus partial. So usually it's a pretty intimate team, like fewer than 10 players most of the time. So you get to know each other really well, um, you know, really close relationship with your coaches. Um, and in terms of playing, it's different than a lot of other collegiate sports because you play year round. Um, there's no true off season in collegiate golf. So in that sense, it was really challenging academically because it wasn't like basketball where, you know, you're just kind of can really lighten your load winter quarter and, you know, kind of put your other classes to the, to the fall and spring in order to concentrate on basketball in the winter. Um, you had it all year long in golf. So you were missing throughout the year. And at Stanford, interestingly enough, even though it's, um, it's a very athletic institution, um, a lot of the professors are, they don't care about athletics at all. So um, they didn't care that I was on the golf team and they flat out told me if I was absent on a given day for a test, I was gonna get a zero on it and things like that. So and for the most part, you had supportive you know, professors that understood and would make um, you know, conditions where you could take a midterm on a different day or things like that. But you definitely ran into some challenges there, but it was, it was well worth it because I, I just love the experience I got both academically and athletically there was top notch. Hmm. And at Stanford, uh, that's where you sort of became more serious about your faith, if I remember our discussions. Is that a fair yeah, uh, absolutely. characterization? So you, can you say a few words about that? Yeah, I grew, up, um, I grew up in a home where we went to church somewhat regularly, I would say. Um, and so I had a, a little bit of a foundation of faith, um, but it really wasn't something that was important in my life, and I, I wouldn't say that, um, I guess I would have called myself a Christian, but now that I have accepted Christ, I realize I was not a Christian. Um, <laughs> but um, when I got to Stanford, I just, um, 
I was in this really academic mode. I was studying so much. I was learning so many things. And I just kind of felt these questions coming into my head for the first time, um, just about like why, why does life exist? And just kind of those big kinds of questions that you know I think a lot of us maybe encounter in college, where you just start questioning everything. And um, I had a, a teammate uh, who I knew went to a Bible study, and I started kind of asking her some questions. And I think I started asking her questions that got a little too hard. And so she said, you need to come to my Bible study and ask my leader these questions. Um, <laughs> So I did. I came and I started asking her leader these questions, and then she, she started to maybe not know the answers to some of the questions I was asking, so she brought in um, someone, like a regional um, gal who supervised the Bible study, and, and she sat down with me, and I would just have these long conversations with people. I was just hungry to learn more. Um, and I, I, I guess I just had gotten to the point in my life where I had, I had been a success up until that point, Everything had gone well for me. I had been a straight-A student in high school. I had earned a full-ride scholarship to Stanford. I was doing well in my classes there. I had been a great golfer. I had won two tournaments my freshman year. I mean, really nothing could have been going any better. I had met my husband. Um, we were dating at the time. I had this great boyfriend. But just- Who was the same person as your husband? Yes, yes, this is him. Yeah, he was my boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> So there was nothing in my life that was wrong, but yet I felt this incompleteness or this emptiness. It's something, there's gotta be something more here. Um, this just doesn't make sense. This, I mean, life can't really get any better, and yet what, why, why do I still have this desire or something that doesn't seem completely to make sense to me? And so um, the more questions I would ask these gals, and they would just give me these answers who, where a lot of times they weren't, it wasn't really an answer answer, but it would just make sense to me. And just, I feel like God just started kind of revealing himself to me in small ways. And um, had a, a, during my time at Stanford as well, a strong Christian friend um, who had just kind of walked alongside me and was there through my faith journey, had never been pushy about it at all. And one night she just said to me, where do you stand with this? Or, you know, kind of where, what have, you, what have you decided, or are, are you a Christian? And I said, well, actually what she said, is, at that point Tyler and I had gotten engaged, and she said, where does Tyler stand? I mean, is he, is he a Christian? And I said, well, we're kind of in the same boat. And she said, well, what boat is that? I mean, she started <laughs> really starting to press me, and I, I think had she asked me these questions two weeks earlier, I would have walked out of her apartment and been like, she was pushy, and man, that was turning me off, but it was just the perfect timing where she caught me right at the time, and I thought, you know, yeah, what is, what boat is this that I'm in? What am I doing here? I'm spending so much time trying to learn about this. And I said, well, I'm just not 100% there yet. I just don't 100% know that this is the truth. And she said, you're never going to know that. There's never going to be a point at which you can say you 100% know this. I mean, Billy Graham wakes up with doubts, she would say. And um, she said, that's why it's called faith. I mean, you get to a point where you've learned enough that it's, a, it's reasonable to kind of make that jump. And... Um, so I felt like I had a very kind of academic coming to Christ, if you will, where I studied a lot. I was really hungry to learn, um, you know, about the history of the resurrection and things like that and trying to kind of prove it in my mind. And then I finally got to the point where you realize you're not going to be able to prove it, but what are you going to do? Kind of reached a crossroads. And like I said, Tyler and I were engaged. Um, and so I, I came to him and I just said, what are we doing with this? You know, we've been both kind of looking at this for a while, and we have to either decide, I think, at some point, are we in or are we out? And we're about to get married. Do we want to make this the foundation of our lives? Do we want this to be, you know, what we build our marriage on, or do we not? Because I don't want to do this if we're just, you know, kind of half in. So um, we both accepted Christ that night. And Tyler came from a stronger faith background than me growing up, so I think it was, it was a, a smaller step for him to um, kind of pray that prayer that night, but um, yeah. <laughs> and that was, what year was that? Your that stand, was uh, 2001, and you maybe the very beginning of 2002, I can't remember the exact and so, But you would have been what, what class uh, at that point? Um, so I had just graduated. Oh, okay, you just graduated, mm -hmm. all right. And um, any reflections on, did that? that uh, impact your life right away in ways that you could? Um, 
see. Yes and no. I mean, I think so often people think you're going to kind of pray this prayer and then just get hit with lightning and suddenly your whole life changes. Um, so I didn't have that. And I didn't have just a crazy, you know, the next day everything was different uh, or anything like that. But, but yeah, I just started to kind of, I guess, I guess things that I didn't realize um, in myself, insecurities that I had, um, things that I was striving after, you just kind of, you started to have a sense of peace. You started to have a sense of security. Um, that that the things that you, the things that you do, or the things you're trying to accomplish, or the goals that you have, do not define you anymore. Um, and so there was just kind of a, a peace, I guess, that that did come over me. But um, nothing, mm -hmm. just crazy. <laughs> okay, so you've just graduated from Stanford. You're going to get married, and are you planning to join the tour at that point? Uh, it was still. Debatable. I'm trying to remember the exact timing. It's all kind of cloudy in my mind because so many things were happening at once. But um, I can't remember at that point if I had fully decided that I was going to play or not. Um, I think I had. The year prior, the year I um, did decide, I think it was 2001 when I decided to turn pro. So just a few months before okay. um, accepting Christ. Um, and what does that mean, deciding to turn pro? I mean, I could decide to turn pro tomorrow. Right. It wouldn't really <laughs> yeah, impact yeah. me. <laughs> well, the, the, the whole thing, yeah, with turning pro is it, it was kind of prior to the year I turned pro, you, there's really no turning back in a sense. It was like you could declare yourself a pro and basically by accepting money in any way for teaching. Which I wouldn't receive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was kind of no turning back. It was like, you had to wait two years at that point, minimum. Even if you played one tournament where you accepted money, there was a minimum two-year requirement to get your amateur status back. So um, I was hesitant. I just didn't 100% know I wanted to pursue professional golf. I wasn't 100% sure I was good enough. And even if I was good enough, I just didn't know if I wanted the lifestyle. Uh, I really enjoyed amateur golf. And because I was kind of late coming into the sport, I hadn't played a ton of amateur golf. So I kind of felt like, oh, I really like playing the USAM and kind of traveling around and seeing these same ladies that I see. So I feel like I would have been satisfied if I had just pursued an amateur career. Um, but the USGA changed the rules the year that I did decide to turn pro, where they said you can go to qualifying school as an amateur. Prior, you had to say, I'm a professional, once you showed up at qualifying school. So you could go, you could try, and you could miss and you're a pro now for two years. There's no kind of safety net. You can't go back and now play amateur golf. So they changed the rules or said, you can stay an amateur, you can go to qualifying school, and then if you don't make it, you're just still an amateur. And so my dad said, I mean, what? it's a free swing in the batter's box. Go, you might as well go do it. I mean, you just go try, because if it doesn't happen, then you can just go back to kind of the original plan. So I literally, I remember sitting in the car with him and I had my application to FedEx for Q school, and it was like I, I still didn't 100% know I even wanted to do it. And I had kind of resolved in my mind, I said, I'm going to go to qualifying school, but unless I get fully exempt status, like unless I get kind of the A, the you know, creme de la creme position on tour where I'm going to get to do all the tournaments, I'm not going to accept it. I was like, if I get the conditional status where you have to go and Monday qualify and it's just such a grind, I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not in for that. So sure enough, I go and I get that status. I get the conditional, so did you, <laughs> kind of low you, man on the totem pole status. Oh, you got conditional, okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm standing there, and now I've got to decide, do I want to take this and turn pro, or do I want to just say no and go back to being an amateur? And there were girls all around me standing at the scoreboard. You know, people are calculating who, where the number of spots and who's got this. And if so-and-so shoots this and comes in, she's going to knock her out. And, and people had like such, it was such like a gravity to the situation for so many people. And there were girls that were just crying that they had, that they had got conditional status after nine years of trying. Or, and I thought, I just came in here <laughs> and I did this for the first time. And I'm going to say no? I'm like, who am I? Who do I think I am? <laughs> I mean, I might, how can I turn this down? I mean, there's been people that have been pursuing this their whole life and, and haven't, you know, or just now achieved it after years of trying. I thought, I've got to do this. This is a chance that I've got to take. And, um, you know, at the time, of course, I would have preferred having full status who wouldn't kind of pick and, pick and choose the tournaments you want to go to. But looking back on it, I'm so thankful that that's the way it, it 
turned out because I really had to get an appreciation for the tour that way. I had to, I developed such an appreciation just to even be in a tournament. Um, you know, you'll see players now so often and they just kind of have this attitude of they deserve things and um, just, or it's just granted. I mean, I got to a point even as a player where it's just granted, you just sign up for a tournament, you choose the tournaments you want. But having that experience my first year where literally you're just clamoring to get into an event, you're Monday qualifying, you're watching the alternate spot list, like please, you know, someone break your ankle, no. <laughs> but, <laughs> You're just dying to get into the tournament. But you didn't try to hurt anyone, right? <laughs> no, right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and then when you got the chance to play, you just relished it. You, were, you took advantage of it. You never got to a point where it's like, oh, well, I'm just going to throw in the towel this week because I've got next week. You didn't have next week. I mean, you only had the tournaments that you got. You never knew when your next chance to tee it up was going to be. So um, I'm really thankful that I have that. And, um, good friend of mine from Stanford who was on the team with me as well. She and I were kind of in the same boat that year doing those Monday qualifiers and she's still playing on tour and she would say the same thing. I mean it just completely I think changed the entire mindset of my career having to kind of work my way into tournaments that year so I'm thankful for it. So you were you had conditional status for a single year? A single year yep and then um, I had only gotten into I think I got into 10 events. I had just barely missed qualifying for the full status through how I had played, which is pretty good for only playing 10 events, but I had to go to qualifying school. Um, I, I decided to go to try to get my, my full exam status, and then I did. Okay. So my second year, I went to qualifying school as well okay. and, uh, and earned fully exam status. By winning Q school or what? Or just scoring high No, enough? yeah, just, just scoring high enough. I can't, yeah. So talk a little bit, um, and you've already talked a little about this year that you were doing the conditional status, but again, for those of us who love the game, or maybe know nothing about the game and will never play on the tour. Talk a little about what life on tour was like for you. Um, it was it was good and bad. Um, you know what you what you see on TV is is not the full picture. I'm sure many of you know, but um, in so many ways it was wonderful and it's an experience that I truly feel so blessed, truly blessed to have had. I mean, I. I traveled the country, I traveled the world with my you know, newlywed husband. I mean, who gets to do that? He was caddying for me, we were traveling all over, we met people all around the country, we stayed in different people, we didn't stay in hotels, we'd do private housing where we'd stay with families. So I've met people that we still keep in touch with even though I'm off the tour now. Um, so in, in so many ways, it was just a crazy opportunity that so few people get to have that, um, that it was wonderful. And I mean, I was playing golf, so and I was earning some money. <laughs> um, so it was, it, yeah, I mean, to play golf for your job, you just kind of every now and then had to be like, you know, reality check here, this mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. But, but it was a grind and, um, you know, maybe especially for me because I was kind of a marginal player um, where I had to do the extra pro-ams, um, I, I had to try to do extra things to earn money in order to offset my expenses. I'm not sure if everyone here would know or how familiar you are with um, tour life, but Professional golfers play, pay all of their own expenses. You know, it's not like you're on any kind of contract the way you would be with a, a normal athletic team in a team sport. Um, so you're essentially guaranteed no income of any kind and you have to cover all of your expenses. And the expenses are very high. I mean, you're traveling around the country every week, usually staying in hotels, renting a car, paying tournament entry fees, paying your caddy. Luckily I had my husband, <laughs> I didn't have to pay, I was staying in people's houses, so I was trying to do things like that. Um, my, my dad would caddy for me when my husband couldn't or my sister would. Um, my mom even caddied for me a couple of times. <laughs> um, just to try to kind of defray expenses a little bit. And um, so it, it can get to be a grind. I mean, you, it sounds glamorous to, to do these things and in some, sometimes it was. Other times it was just horrible, I mean, you would, finish rain delayed round on a Sunday, you get off the course at 7.30 at night, now you've missed your flight to get to the next tournament, you've got a pro-am at 7 a.m. Monday morning in Cincinnati, and you're in, you know, who knows where, and now you've got to figure out a way, okay, let's rent a car at this 10 at night and drive through the night with three other players, pull into someone's driveway of a home I've never met at four in the morning and say, Where's the bedroom? I got to get an hour and a half of sleep before I have to get back out for this pro-am. So, um, and by the way, maybe I played horrible on that Sunday in that rain delay and I made $800 last week and my expenses were $2,500. Um, so, you know, the, 
there were times when it was just a lot of pressure, um, a lot of like, especially because my husband was caddying for me, as awesome as that was, I was the only person earning money. So um, it, could, it can kind of get to be a grind just in terms of, of the week to week nat nature of it. And it, it never gives up. Um, you just had to keep going. And then um, also just kind of the pressure of performance-based pay completely. Right. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound, you're thinking, that doesn't sound that bad. No. <laughs> you're like playing golf every day. That's actually not what I'm thinking. No, it's not what I'm thinking at all. I'm thinking, okay. I'm not sure how deep into the weeds I want to go with this, but, um, just, but as long as you brought it up, say a little bit, the performance-based, uh, how to pay, mm -hmm. right? I mean, talk a little, those of us who play the game, who, who here golfs, just out of curiosity? Most of you? Okay. You know, as many people have said, it's, you know, the ball is sitting still. No one's guarding you. There isn't any noise. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard, and yet everyone knows that if you want to perform well, you can you get nervous, you start getting doubts in your mind, and the next thing you know, you shank a shot, right? Mm -hmm. So when, you're, when your livelihood depends on it, just talk a little about what, or maybe it doesn't affect people who make it to the pros, but oh, I've no. always been, it oh, does. It, oh, it does, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it, it absolutely does in the same way. I can tell you, having been a player who shot 129 all the way up to being a touring professional, it's the same. You guys experience the same kind of, oh my gosh, have I ever played this game before type of feeling. And you may not notice it in a pro as much, like you might still think they look pretty good, but believe me, they go through days like that too, and I mean, I've had, I've had rounds where I've gone through, you know, shanking it or something, and it's, it's, it's just all the more embarrassing as a professional, I guess, because you're like, people pay, paid to come and watch me do this. And, ah. um, so I guess it adds maybe a little bit more pressure because you feel like other people are relying on you to play well. You know, normally it's just you and no one else, I, I don't care what you shoot, you know what right, I mean? Yeah. So, but it's kind of like, you know, kids came to watch me play and, oh my gosh, how could I have shot 85 in a, professional tournament I'm supposed to be so much better than that um, so yeah you definitely have those days where you wake up and, and sometimes you can tell right away on the range you're just like oh my gosh it's just gonna be who knows what's gonna happen out there today let's try to just you know keep some band-aids on this and, and you definitely still have those days as a pro and yeah I mean when you're doing it for money it's it's all the more I guess disappointing when you do have those days or um, but yeah, I learned as a pro to kind of make it through those days. And there were tournaments where I did make money and I was having those days the whole time. I mean, you kind of learn how to grind. You learn how to rely on, you know, your chipping and your putting or to latch onto some part of your game that could kind of get you through. Mm. Um, but yeah, players, I think for the most, I can tell you for sure players, when they're playing well, are not thinking about the money. They're mm. not thinking about either how much they need to make or how much they're going to make and how great it's going to be, um, they're playing the game. And I think that's when, when anybody plays their best. Same with you guys when you're playing, you know, bets with your partner. You know, it, it, you do the best when you don't think about it and then you collect the money at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which is a foreshadowing of the opening. But before we get to the open, so you make the tour as a fully exempt player. And um, I forget, how many years were you on the tour before you won the open? Uh, I won it then that next year. This is so becoming my, a theme, Hillary. You seem yeah. to do things and then quickly. achieve quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like for being a fully exempt player versus a con uh, conditional? Well, it was heaven. I mean, yeah. it started out as heaven at least because it was just, oh, I get to, it, especially the beginning of the year for the LPGA, um, those are the hardest tournaments. I mean, people are just dying to play. It's been the off season. Nobody skips Phoenix. Um, you know, kind of the top events of the year, the beginning of the year. So these are all events I, I didn't get to play in the year prior. So now here I am, I'm getting to show up, I'm, I'm in these big tournaments, um, but I did not play well. So yeah. then that was kind of a, oh, well, you know, just missing cuts, missing cuts, um, kind of had a, a, a pretty rotten start to Do you the know year. Why? Can you? Um, no, 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 just, just the game. again, okay. the game, yeah, it was yeah. just kind of okay. one of those, who knows, I, I think maybe, um, I probably had put a little bit more pressure on myself without even knowing it. It was probably, oh, well, last year I almost got my fully exempt card and I was only in 10 tournaments. So this year, you know, let's really see what I can do or I'm, I'm going to do so great or I kind of had some expectations of myself. Um, 
And I will never forget going to, I don't even think I've told you this, this is just coming out right now. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> uh, going to a tournament in LA that spring, and my parents had come to watch me. They spend the winters in Arizona, so they drove over to LA. And uh, I had a, this old um, Ford Explorer that I was driving around to save money. Again, I'm driving from turn tournament to tournament at this point instead of flying. And uh, I, I don't think I had made a cut in quite a while. And my dad was caddying for me. Um, and I, I made the cut that week, and I was so thrilled that I was going to make some money. Um, and Saturday, my car broke down just bad. Just it was all kinds of things had to happen to it to get fixed, things I couldn't afford to do um, to it at that point. I thought, well, at least I'm going to make some money this week. I mean, at least I made the cut. I'm going to be able to. But, but it was starting to look like I probably need to buy a new car at this point. It's not worth it to put as much money into this car as I need to. So of course, you know, my dad's there. And he's, he's I play terrible, absolutely horrible. I have one of the worst rounds. I mean, just an embarrassing, embarrassing round on Sunday um, to the point where I am bawling when I come off the 18th green. Not because I'm, I think I had started, you know, that week again, I need to pay. I kind of wanted to be my own adult now. Here I am, you know, my dad's caddying for me, but I can do this, I can make my money this week and, you know, take, fix my car, and I played terrible, I make basically no money, and, um, and I was just embarrassed. I was so embarrassed for the little girls that came out to watch me play that day, or I just thought, how, how can I be doing this anymore? How can, it was kind of like rock bottom for me. Um, and, you know, my dad was there to save the day, and, oh, I'll buy, I'll buy you a car, and um, it's okay, you know, he's just trying to make it all better. It's okay, I'm like, it's not about you buying me a car, you know. <laughs> um, someday you can pay me back, he says. Well, like 60 days later, I win the U.S. Open, and he's like, you owe me $32,741, <laughs> which I paid him, like, to the dollar, exactly what I owed him. Um, it was like one of the first things out of his mouth was how much money I owed him. Um, and anyone who knows my dad will absolutely attest to that that would be the first thing he would think about. Um, <laughs> but it, and it, He's not here tonight, No, he? he's not. Okay. They're, they're in All Arizona right. right now. But um, it... It was kind of an amazing transformation to go from kind of that rock bottom place after that round where I remember saying to my dad, I'm embarrassed to be a professional golfer. Like I'm, I, was, I was so um, like kind of outside of myself at that point. I was so worried about what the little girls who come to watch me play are thinking. And, and he was like, you've got, you got to just play the game. And you've got to just get back to, you know, forget all this. Forget the fact that you your car was broken down, and how are you going to pay for this, and how are you going to do that? He was like, just go back to playing the game that you love to play, and just do it. let's just do that for a little while and kind of see what happens. You know, my dad's always been the kind of person that he's like, you know, you don't have fun because you play well. You play well because you have fun. You know, he's always been like kind of this little <laughs> cheerleader and one of those rolling my eyes at my dad, but it was so true. He just, I just kind of said after that, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with this. I've reached. I, I, I didn't realize how much pressure I was putting on myself, um, and just kind of thought, he's right. I've got to just go and play and let it work itself out. Um, I've, I'm gonna. I'm gonna make it through this year, even if I don't make any money. I'm gonna survive. It's not like I'm gonna, not gonna have food on the table. We've got kind of a backup system here, you know. Um, and so I was able to. Uh, like I said, I think it was fewer than 60 days later that I won the Open. I just kind of got on this little roll. Um, just started playing, started having fun, had a few decent tournaments where I made some cuts, and then I think the three weeks leading into the Open were three of my better weeks, that I, or the best weeks I had had on tour. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of in a, I was in a good state of mind, I guess. Okay, and which is a great segue <laughs> to the Open. Um, so talk about, you know, you were so playing well going into the Open, and you get there that week, and talk about sort of how the weekend goes at the Open. Um, yeah, well, at this, point, yeah, say, at this yeah. point, Tyler was caddying for me. He, um, again, I can't quite remember how it worked out. I think he was in business school at the time, and no, he's shaking no. his head no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how it was like summer, and you had some few weeks off, or somehow he was able to caddy for me for a few weeks. So it was just kind of this great, again, oh, my husband's out for a few weeks. Again, kind of just positive state of mind. Every, I'm now just playing golf to play golf, you know, for a few weeks and experiencing success kind of as a side note. Um, and I was, I had gotten enough of a role that I had a few c 
goals, I guess you would say, in my mind coming into the US Open. Um, I, my main goal was I wanted to make the cut because that would get me enough money to get into the British Open. And that was really my, my goal, if you will, was I really would like to go to the British Open. I think that would be a cool experience to have in my career. So that's kind of you know, where my mind was. Um, and obviously God <laughs> had something very <laughs> different um, in mind for what was going to happen that week. And I was, I was uh, willing and ready to let that happen. But um, a, another kind of side note about the week, uh, the, the Open um, in 2003 when I won was at Pumpkin Ridge uh, Golf Course in Portland, Oregon. And I had qualified to play the US Open at Pumpkin Ridge when I was 16 years old. Um, it was the first, I mean, again, I had told, said when I first started playing, I really hardly had any national experience. I couldn't even get into these AJGA events. Um, you had to have certain kind of record in order to get into these events, and I didn't have that kind of record. And I qualified for the US Open. It was like, okay, <laughs> there we go. I did something that's going to be on my resume. So it was kind of like the, a big, huge deal at the time that I had qualified for this. Again, my dad took me there, caddied for me, awesome experience, played absolutely terribly, you know, shot a couple of 87s or 89s or something and missed the cut by just a million. But I was kind of just excited to go back, just to say, oh, well, here, here I am now, you know, seven, eight years later, um, and let's see what I can do there now. I mean, obviously my game's very different, and I had enjoyed the golf course, but I thought, I think it's just going to be interesting to see how I play there now versus at age 16. And it just kind of had a good memories in my mind of, oh, this is you know, my, the first place I ever played the US Open. So, um, so I was kind of heading into it just sort of with that attitude, I guess. And um, it was, I don't even know how to describe, begin to describe the week. Um, everything was just um, like perfect. I don't know how to describe it. And the weather was perfect. My husband calls me a weather diva. Like, I complain about the weather under all circumstances. Um, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's too windy. It's, if there was just a slight breeze, it would be better. It's like, <laughs> I'm one of those people who just am not ever satisfied with the weather. And the weather was perfect. Every day there, just gorgeous, gorgeous weather. I mean, really, couldn't have been better. So for me, this is ideal. I don't have to deal with my rain gear. I don't have to you know, deal with any of this stuff you know, that I normally have to navigate with my game. Um, and so that just put me in a happy mood. <laughs> um, having Tyler Caddy for me, kind of, again, like I said, coming in off a couple of good weeks, and I kind of had this attitude of, I'm just playing golf. I'm not worried about the money and, and what's going to happen. Um, my parents had come to watch me. I have a couple old Stanford teammates that live in Portland, so they came out to watch me. So I just kind of had this great feeling around the week. It was just going to be a fun week, no matter what happened. You know, I was going to go out to dinner with friends. It was just going to be one of those weeks on tour um, that you enjoy. And um, also, the course was perfect for me, literally. Um, I'm a, anyone, I guess, who might know my game at all knows that I'm a really good putter. And that's kind of the key to my game. And I love like really fast, smooth greens. That's just. I play terrible on like slow Bermuda, the British Open as much as I liked it, never play good there. I just don't <laughs> do well on that kind of surface. But these greens were like just pool tables. I mean, just so fast, lightning fast, perfectly smooth. Um, so I was loving that. Um, the course, again, anyone who would know my game knows I hit the ball really short. Um, and so the ground was rock hard. The ball was just going a mile. Um, so that kind of part of my game, and I hit the ball very straight. So in a US Open, that's what you want to do. It doesn't, you know, if, if, the, if the ground's soft, um, players who hit it really far, the ball will just land and kind of stop. Well, in the US Open, it's going to land. It's going to keep rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling to the rough if you're off at all. So you want to be kind of short and accurate. Um, and, and that's kind of my game. Also, Pumpkin Ridge, um, the, the biggest weakness in my game is if I miss a shot, I hit it thin, um, which is usually a big problem if there's water in front of the green or a bunker in front of the green, or because um, it just goes a little lower, a little shorter. Well, at Pumpkin Ridge, there's absolutely no water in front of any greens, basically, or bunkers. And so if you hit it thin, it just bounces onto the green. You just land shorter and bounces on instead of lands like on that. and stays on. <laughs> 
So it was like it was just kind of made for me. Um, and you know, had I showed up there on a week where I really was off my game, you know, I easily could have still played, had a really poor week. But I was on my game, um, and and the course set up perfectly for me. So again, in the practice rounds, I was just kind of starting to get jazzed up about it that it was going to be a fun week, and I was really looking forward. But at this point, winning the tournament has still not crossed my mind at all. I mean, I'm just not that kind of player. And I probably would, sh you know, shock people to hear this because you, you know, all you hear from pros is they have this mindset of like, you're going to win every week and you're the best in the world and almost like brainwashing yourself that, that these are the things you have to tell yourself. Well, that is not where I was at all. Um, and I was, you know, not like I'm saying, oh gosh, I'm worried about my game either though. It's just, hey, this is awesome. This is going to be fun. And, um, you know, looking back on it, it's like, why couldn't I recapture that feeling ever again? <laughs> yeah. Why could I not recreate kind of that, that mindset? I mean, I, I can describe it now, but it, it, it was something that is so hard to recreate. And I've, you've ha I've had that feeling before in certain rounds, um, many rounds, um, but I've never had that feeling for an entire week yeah. um, the way that I had it that week at the US Open, just kind of that I guess you would call it like serenity almost in a way. It was just mm -hmm. like I was focused and I, I was trying, but at the same time I just had this peace about it. It was just like I was just happy despite what might happen. So after the first round, you're where on the leaderboard, do you remember? Uh, I don't remember exactly. I don't really think I was on the radar screen too bad. I mean, I had had a decent round or two. Okay. Of, um, I, I think, you know, obviously I had made the cut. Um, and I think by the, I think I had played, what it was is I had played early the second round. So I kind of got a decent score in early and I, but I was not on the radar screen in terms of who was going to be leading the tournament. But I had finished early and I was kind of out of there. Well then as the day went on, I think the wind maybe picked up a little bit or scores started going higher and I kind of had climbed up the leaderboard um, to the point where I can't remember if I actually was in the leader group Saturday or maybe the second or third group on Saturday okay. heading into the weekend. And so on Saturday, did you play early again, or? No, so at that point I was playing pretty late. Now I actually am on the leaderboard. I mean, when I played the second round, I wasn't. Um, but, you know, now, now I'm showing up for the third round and I am on the leaderboard. And I, I mix up the days in my mind so much because <laughs> there were so many days. But I think I was paired with a former Stanford player. Is this right, Tyler? Yes, okay. <laughs> Uh, her name's Vari Mackay, and uh, she and I didn't play at Stanford at the same time. She was four years ahead of me, so I came in right when she had finished. Um, but I was playing with her, so that kind of settled my nerves a little bit, that I was playing with Vari, because I knew her. She was leading the tournament. Um, actually, in fact, I think she had been leading the tournament by quite a bit, but triple bogeyed the last hole the day before to kind of make me kind of right, right there with her. Um, so it put me at ease to be playing with her. Um, and. I think that day also, Tyler will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but the first shot that I hit into the first hole, I lipped out and hit it about this far away. No, the third round? Tyler, would okay, you like I to come up Okay, I did something. Here? Yeah, Tyler, you should be up here. Um, I did something really good <laughs> <laughs> on the first hole that just kind of like put me at ease. It was kind of like, okay. Yeah. Uh, and you, um, so from that point on, you know, kind of, you know, in your head, you think what's going to happen is you're going to screw up. I mean, here I am. This is the first time I've ever done this. I mean, the expectation is at some point, okay, I'm going to make a few birdies. Great. I'm leading. But at some point, I'm going to hit a shot or I'm going to do something. I'm going to start three putting. The nerves are going to get to me. And it just never happened. I mean, it just kind of kept going and I just let it happen. It was just, I felt like, I felt like I was in control of my game in a sense where, um, especially my putting, I just, you know, you kept having the expectation of like, well, you know, normally you would miss this putt or something, but it was like, I could make it and I just knew I could make it and I just went ahead and made it. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. It was just, um, uh, like, Serenity is the word that keeps coming. I was doing a Bible study recently where it said, to be in God's presence gives um, gentle delight and serenity like none else. And that's the feeling that I had. Gentle delight is exactly what I would say. I wasn't on a high. I wasn't like in a, 
a zone where you get in these kind of highs on the golf course where you just, let's get to the next hole. Come on, here we go, I'm gonna birdie. I, I've had that feeling before, and that's not what I had. It was, it was gentle delight, is what I would say, where it was just purely one shot at a time, truly enjoying playing. Like, I was able to somehow completely focus on whatever the shot was and not worry about how I got to this shot or what I was gonna do on the next shot. Um, and it sounds so simple because everyone always says in golf, it's just one shot at a time, one shot at a time. And the, the reason everybody's saying that all the time is because that's so hard to do. <laughs> uh, they have to say that to themselves. I can attest to that, Yeah, I mean, it is so hard to do. And pros get that way too, where you birdie a couple and all of a sudden you're, okay, that was 32 on the, hey, I'm gonna, well, even if I mess up, I'm gonna shoot in the 60s. It's like you, you kind of start to, count in your mind too and I just I wasn't doing that I wasn't keeping track of stats in my head sometimes you're thinking about like calculating oh how am I putting today or you just you have these things where you have to constantly be driving things out of your mind as a player like don't think about that or you're having to constantly push other things into your mind to kind of distract yourself and I just didn't have that I had this ability to just be completely present with the shot that I had and go with it I wasn't thinking about whether or not I was going to win the tournament or be leading that night or what sh you know, score I was going to shoot or how many birdies I was going to make or what if I mess up. I, just those thoughts weren't coming in my head. The bunker shot, was that on Sunday or was that on the playoff? That was on Sunday. That was on Sunday. So say a word about the bunker <coughs> shot. Um, so the final round, the 18th hole was kind of a bear for me. It was a birdie hole for most players. It was a par five, reachable in two. But there's a huge um, ravine to cross with your second shot. And again, being the short hitting player that I am, um, just to even get over the ravine, I have to hit a good drive. And then I better not hit that thin shot that I was talking about because it's going to go in the ravine. So this is one of the times at Pumpkin Ridge where, OK, I can't screw up this shot. Um, well, I come to the 18th hole, I nail my drive, um, and I have to stand in the fairway for about 25 minutes because Annika Sorenstam's in the group in front of me and she has this really lengthy ruling that's happening. Um, so I just have to stand over this shot <laughs> for 25 minutes, um, which is, and this is the 18th was like hole. an eternity. Yeah. Okay. And this is like the scary, basically this is, this is one of the scariest shots of my life. Um, well, I catch it thin, um, and it, I thought it was just done. I mean, I thought I was, had hit it in the junk, and um, well, it got, somehow it just got over the ravine and was in this fairway bunker, which is the other, like, worst part of my game. <laughs> um, so it's like, oh, fairway bunker. And not only that, we get over to this fairway bunker, and it's got, like, this huge lip, there's a tree overhanging. It's, it's kind of over way to the right. Like, you're not supposed to be in this bunker. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the pin is on the left. Well, at Pumpkin Ridge, the green goes like this, basically. And if you go to the left of the green, literally, it's like death, especially if the pin is left there. It's going to be one of those where you're like putting up and down 10 times, trying to get it back up on the green. So normally, if you're in the fairway, you would play quite a bit to the right of this pin um, to avoid that kind of shot happening. Well, I'm in this right fairway bunker. The only way I cannot hit this tree that's overhanging is to aim right at the pin. And if I pull it a couple feet, I'm off the green. First of all, I can't even hit this shot. <laughs> I mean, I really can't. It, my husband will tell you. <laughs> I'm a terrible fairway bunker player. Again, the thin shot, getting it over a lip, just not gonna happen. So I am so nervous on this shot, and I'm thinking, just get it out of the bunker. Just don't hit, like here's now I start getting that, those thoughts in my mind that you know you normally get. I'm like, it's, don't hit the lip and like have it go back in this ravine and make a 10 or something stupid like that. Just let me just get, even if I have to get it out of the bunker. Um, but I had seen, um, I, needed to, I needed to make a par. I mean, I needed to get, I couldn't just like chip out and I, I had to make par in order to get in a playoff. I had to make a birdie to win. And I knew that at this point. So I thought, I've, I gotta do this. I gotta try to hit this shot. So I pull out a nine iron and I'm standing over the shot and I start thinking of all these things that could go wrong with the shot and I start doing the things you normally do. And I, I back away, cause I'm just like, I'm looking at the tree, I'm looking at the lip and I, I backed away and I, this is the first time I've ever done this in my life, but I was like, 
God, I cannot hit this shot. <laughs> like truly, I can't hit this shot. And I'm like, need you. <laughs> And I stood up to the shot, I just walked right up to it then, and I swung, I swear, I just didn't even think. I just walked up and I swung. And I hit this shot like a, just a laser, just flies right up over the lip, misses the tree, goes right at the, like dead at the pin. Also, by the way, I have no ability to get the nine iron to the green, like in terms of the distance that I had to get it. I had to hit a nine iron in order to get it over the lip, because I, I couldn't possibly take an eight iron. But I should have come up way short of the green. Well, it must have been adrenaline or something. I mean, there's. It flies all the way into the green, right up there where I have this like perfect little uphill, you know, 15 foot birdie putt. And I, I'm looking at my husband, and he's looking at me like, oh, "How did you hit that shot?" I don't know. <laughs> um, and I didn't tell him at that point that I had prayed or anything like that. Um, <laughs> and my dad, after the round, came up to me and was like. You can't hit that shot. I was like, I know. And I've had players, even players that are the same kind of player as me, like short hitting players. Like, I don't know if any of y'all know who Rosie Jones is. Um, but Rosie Jones came up to me a couple weeks later and she was like, everybody's talking about that putt you made to win the US Open. She goes, but I want to talk about that bunker shot you hit the day before. She was like, I mean, how'd you hit that shot? And I was like, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's at the point where Players knew that like I should not have been able to hit that shot. I mean, they knew how hard it was. It didn't look maybe as hard on TV because you couldn't see the tree and whatnot. But um, well, I get to the green and you know I should have been thinking, knock in this putt to win the U.S. Open. But now I come back to my you know humanity again of uh, don't three putt and <laughs> and not get in the playoff. I mean, you got to at least give it a chance, but. I mean, like I saw, talked about, the green is like this. Again, I've got this uphill putt. I mean, if I hit this two feet past the hole, that is going to be the scariest two-footer. I've up left to right, downhill, two-foot. No, I'm going to just kind of lag that puppy up there, you know, this far short of the hole or whatever, and tap it in for par. Um, so, you know, normally people say you've got this putt, you know, when you're training young girls or you know, you've got this putt to win the U.S. Open. Well, my dad used to actually, interestingly enough, when he would kind of coach me, say, you have to two putt this to win the U.S. Open. Mm. Because he thought it was like more pressure in a way. Like when you're trying to make something, it's like all or none. I mean, give it a go because if you miss, who cares? But when you have to two putt, it was like, it was like this delicate balance of, well, how do you do that? Like, how do you kind of scale yourself back? Well, you want to act like it's a normal shot, but you at the same time kind of want to give yourself a buffer. So my dad used to, when he was kind of training me, say, you have to two-putt this to win the US Open. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of what I had, had said to myself, even though it was to get into the playoff, was kind of more, you have to two-putt this. And, and, and Tyler knew that that was kind of in my head, and Johnny Miller gave me a hard time about it later. Oh, how could she have been trying to just two-putt? What a wimp. You know, I should have been trying to make it to win. Who tries to two putt to tie? But um, I just mentally knew uh, <laughs> that's where I was at at that point was I needed to two putt that. My hands were shaking and um, reality was starting to set in a little bit. So, so you two putt it? I two putt it. And we, I want to get to a chance for people here to ask a couple of questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you something that maybe one of them would ask you. Obviously, is there anything you want to say about the Monday playoff? I guess just, you won it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So I won 18 hole playoff on Monday, um, three people in the playoff, which was an awesome setup because it kind of gave me the ability to say, okay, it's just a normal round of golf. It's not like a playoff head to head, you against her. It was three of us. Mm -hmm. So I was able, okay, it's just a 9.30 tea time. These are your playing partners. I was kind of <laughs> able to sort of trick myself into thinking this is just a round, you know, just go out and play. Um, and. I had gotten out to a, a, a hot lead early on, um, and then midway through one of the players, it kind of started fading away. It became more and more clear that she wasn't going to kind of be in it. Um, and Angela Stanford is the person I kind of ended up being head to head to the last few holes. And she really <clears throat> started putting the pressure on the last few holes, making some birdies. Um, again, circumstances, if you could draw it up, you would rather win the playoff by five shots or you know the way things had been playing out but of course now that it worked out the way it did where I had to make a putt on the last hole I made a, about a 15 footer um, in order to win the playoff after she had rolled in a putt about a 45 foot putt from off the green 
Um, again, I'm walking up to the green thinking, I'm going to have to two putt to win the US Open. Same as the day before, two putt, two putt. Oh, suddenly she just made it from 45 feet off the green. Okay, <laughs> I've got to make this. Um, and again, I kind of had a feeling right before she made it that, that she was going to make it, so it didn't surprise me, and I was able to really um, focus and, um, and just knock it in. I think at that point, I was, I was tired. <laughs> I was like, I want this thing over with. I've played 90 holes, grinding it out. You know, this, this is all I can take. I, I don't, I don't want to go any more holes. Knock this in. You know, again, what? How was I thinking that at that point? I should, have, I should have been thinking U.S. Open and what's going to happen. I was just like, I want to make this putt and get this over with. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations on Thank winning, you. by the way. The one, the final question I will ask you before we let some of the people here ask questions is, um, obviously this is about faith and golf, and you said a few words throughout about it, but, um, and you talked about offering the prayer in the bunker and making the shot that you, by all rights, shouldn't have been able to hit. Do you think God cares if you win? This is sort of the question, right, for sporting teams when they pray before a game. Does God care? So you said something when we had coffee last that I really liked. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember what it was. Yeah. But <laughs> um, I'm sure whatever well, you think, say will be wonderful. Yeah, I, th I think the first thing I would say to that question is, um, I think anyone would have to be really careful when you fill in the blank of God doesn't care about X. Um, I really don't think there's an arena of life that you can say God doesn't have his hand there or God doesn't care about what happens there. I think, and I think what I said to you at coffee maybe was, um, I truly think of myself as a child of God and we're all children of God and if something is on my heart or something is of interest to me, I believe it matters to God. And I, and I do believe there are certain times or places or arenas where God might have a specific purpose for someone to win a game or something for various reasons. I, I don't think God, um, you know, came down and, you know, made me win the U.S. Open because of something that needed to happen. Um, but at the same time, um, I do believe he cares. Um, I don't think he cares week to week who, you know, wins. I don't think he's keeping a tally up there of what's going on, but... Um, in terms of that, but I mean, I experienced it that week that he was there for me. And I think so often, um, you know, we, you'll hear people say that we underestimate what God can do. Um, like, do we really pray thinking he's going to cure cancer? You know, do we, do we really like trust? And you know, God has, God said in Isaiah, you know, is my arm not long enough? Like, can I not do that? Do you think I can't do this? But I think we often make the other mistake too, where we think something is like, too unimportant for God. Um, like, does God care about how I hit this golf shot? I mean, you know, like, I'm not going to ask him about this golf shot. I mean, this is like, who cares about this golf shot? There's people starving. I mean, but at the same time, I think there's nothing you can say God doesn't care about. And, and like, as his child, you can call upon him in any matter. And I think not only do we make the mistake of, um, you know, thinking maybe God isn't powerful enough to do something so big, but sometimes we have something in our life that we care about, but we think, oh, God, I'm not going to bother him with this. Um, and, and that's not what he wants. You know, if something is heavy on our heart or something is important to us, you know, we were designed to live with him. And so to kind of not cut him in on that conversation or on that part of your life, um, you know, I don't think is, is the way he would want it. So. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You know, Tyler, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, in all seriousness, do you see the soundboard right behind you? Tyler's going to be on the bag for me now. <laughs> you should see a, uh, a little label that says chancel off to your left. Do you see C-H-A? It's spelled wrong, actually. C-H-A-N-C-L. Oh, Scott's going to help. Scott, we need numbers six and seven on. Uh, we're going to let you all an ask some uh, questions. Um, just a quick couple of announcements from me, though. The, the 2012 or 2011 2012 series ends. Uh, Hillary here is our fourth speaker. Our fifth speaker will be on April 20th, a gentleman named Eric Metaxas, who actually just spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast. He's the author of a book called Bonhoeffer. He was also the author of the uh, 
book that was the accompanying book to the movie Amazing Grace, if any of you saw that about William Wilberforce. Uh, so I hope you can be here for that. April 20th, that's a Friday night, 7 o'clock here uh, in the sanctuary again. And as always, I just want to say a deep, deep word of gratitude and appreciation to all of the many people and organizations that make this series possible and have made it possible for the last uh, nine years. Uh, we, this is not a budget item on the church, for the church, either at St. Philip Deacon or Mount Olivet. It's paid entirely through the generosity of individuals and corporations who support it, and many of them are here tonight, and I think they deserve our thanks. So thank you very much. Okay, we'll take um, you know, 10, 15 minutes if people have additional questions. And by the way, I have new respect for Charlie Rose. Um, and there are lots of other questions I could, th I could have thought to ask. But uh, if anyone has questions, you can come to the mic at either side. Or if you just want to yell them out, uh, that's OK, too. And I'm going to assume these questions are going to be for you, Hillary, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> yes, thank you. I would like to ask um, a question about motherhood. Now that you're a mother mm -hmm. and you have young daughters, I just wanted to ask you what you do to help your daughters find their passion and how you relate to them on faith and life. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, this is the direction that my life has gone now. I, like Tim mentioned, I don't play golf basically at all now. Um, play literally a handful of times a year if I can get the opportunity to, to go out. Um, <laughs> I, I guess um, I do my best. You know, I do, I do what you can do. Um, at this age, they're four and two. So, um, you know, just trying to lay a s foundation of faith for them at this point. Um, you know, we go to church every week. They're involved in their, um, their church classroom there. Um, I go to a Bible study every week, uh, BSF Bible Study Fellowship, where there's um, a really wonderful training program for young children there. Um, we, you know, read a devotional that I thought would be kind of fun to have on the table to do here and there, and my four-year-old is like every meal. She wants me to read one of these devotionals and go through the questions and, and kind of answer the questions about the story. Um, and I guess just uh, being real with them. Um, they, 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 can, they see me uh, struggle with being their mother. Um, they see me on a daily basis uh, getting frustrated and um, having to, I'll stop and I'll, I'll ask them for forgiveness if I um, was, you know, too quick to yell at them about something or if I got impatient or um, they'll, they'll see me bend down and ask them for forgiveness or pray to God for forgiveness that I was, you know, too quick to yell or things like that. So I guess trying to be authentic with them and not have them think that um, faith is just this perfect, easy life that, uh, that they're just automatically going to have. Um, but in, in terms of trying to find their passion, um, I guess just trying to be encouraging. You know, I think like the kind of things I told you about my dad tonight and, you know, as, as much as he was kind of one of those dads that I sort of rolled my eyes at when he would say all these positive and encouraging things, um, both, you know, as a, as a child in whatever sport I was involved in um, or as my caddy. Um, I try to do that for my kids. I, I feel like growing up, my parents never pressured me in any way of that I needed to do something important or you need to be in, as much as a, of a golfer as my dad was. He never pressured me into the game. Um, so people ask me all the time, like, oh, do your girls play golf? Do you have them out there? Are you just, you know? I mean, they've been to the golf course a couple of times. They're four and two. You know, I'm not driving them into the game. If they want to play golf, that's going to be great. If they want to do whatever they want to do. Um, so trying to be encouraging with whatever passions I kind of see in them um, at the time and, and just not limiting them at this point, um, but doing my best to kind of try to lay a foundation of faith for them to, to have um, and, and not just have it be a, a part of their life, but have it be their life, you know, so that they see me living it daily, um, praying with them throughout the day, like I said, when things are going well, thanking God, and when things are not going well, stopping and saying, you know, we need to, mommy needs to pray for forgiveness that she just did that, or um, we need to pray for God right now to kind of, yesterday we were trying to get into our car, and I fell um, pretty hard, and um, both my girls fell like three times on our icy driveway, and um, 
just having their, trying to have one of their first thoughts be, we need to pray that we can get through our driveway and into our car. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I like that that was one of their first thoughts, was like, God, help us get into our car. I mean, again, that's one of those things where I was saying, I think we, we limit, oh God, he can, we pray to him for these big things, but just having them see that you know, daily, our, our first inclination should be that, that we need God in so many things. So that's what I'm trying to instill in them. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, a thrust is a good word to have used because it was like it just changed overnight in that sense. I mean, it was one of those, I went, drove the next day to, um, we went to Vancouver for the Canadian Open I played the following week and I drove into the parking lot and went in to register for the tournament the way I do any other time in my sweats and my whatever junk I had on from driving from Portland and there's media everywhere, you know, cameras on me and people want to talk and it was kind of this wake up call of like, oh, oh gosh, this is just not something I was expecting or what I'm used to. Um, so yeah, being thrust into the limelight was a big adjustment um, and I don't, I think I handled it well in the terms of I didn't let it super bother me, but um, I did kind of start to put added expectations on myself of like, okay, now I won the open, like I need to prove that wasn't a fluke or you know, that, 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 I, that I really did win that week and that didn't just happen and um, now I should qualify for the Solheim Cup team? I mean, I really should. I mean, I won the US Open, I'm right there. I mean, it would just be ridiculous if I didn't qualify for the Solheim Cup team, which by the way, I didn't um, because of probably how much pressure I put on myself and missed endless amounts of cuts you know, the following weeks after that. Um, so in that sense, handling the limelight was hard um, and also opportunities were just coming like crazy opportunities. I mean, like people were coming to me and telling me they were gonna make a movie. And just like, I mean, like at this point, it was so hard to sift out like what's, what's real and like who's genuine and like, um, so kind of holding on to my family, my solid friends, thank goodness I had an agent already um, prior to the US Open because trying to pick an agent at that point, not knowing who to really trust or who would have kind of been just coming after me trying to make a quick buck right there. Um, so I had an agent I could trust that could handle things. Um, so that's kind of the way I handled the limelight, in some ways good, in some ways not so good. Um, in terms of the role model part, I honestly didn't see myself hugely different after winning the Open as I did prior to winning. Like I said, even just talking about that tournament in LA where I was bawling after that round, the reason I was bawling was I was like thinking about little girls that were coming to watch me play and that, that had, you know, bought a ticket with their dad and were so excited to come and see someone really play great and they came and watched me shoot 87, you know. Um, and so I had always kind of already had that mindset of I'm a role model um, to these girls and they see whether you give up or not and um, they see, you know, the kind of the effort you put in and um, so I don't think a huge amount changed. Obviously the amount of attention that was on me and, and, and Rightly, you know, like you said, the, the um, potential for the number of girls that were now going to look to me was different, but I guess I really wasn't thinking about that. I had always kind of seen myself already that way. Speaking of uh, young players, do any of you, I see you talking amongst yourselves, one of you have a question for <laughs> How do you practice or what do you focus on? Um, that's a good question. I don't practice now because I never play. <laughs> if I can play, that's, that's enough. But, um, you know, when I first started, um, the main way I practiced was by playing. I would just go out and play and play and play and play. Um, and maybe that is because I kind of got into the game a little bit late and I honestly didn't even just have enough holes under my belt to really um, be a good enough player at that point. And so I would just go out and play. There's no substitute for playing. Um, the, just the difference in the lie that you get, the conditions, everything is so different than it is on the range or the putting green. So um, if you have a place where you can go um, when it's not super crowded, maybe late at night, places where you can go and just kind of like dink around and jump from hole to hole and be practicing different shots and playing a lot of holes, 
I still think that's the best way to practice. It's kind of hard to do if you don't have a course where you can kind of have that, that leeway to do that. Um, I kind of got into uh, good and bad things with practice when I got to college. Prior to going to college, you're on totally on your own, basically. The high school coach I had was very relaxed and basically just practiced how you want to practice. So I didn't practice a lot. I was a player to practice. You know, I just go out and play nine holes. That's my practice. Um, so I was not a ball beater, um, and I had a pretty naturally good short game. I didn't practice it a bunch. Well, then you get to college, and it was like mandated three-hour practices every day, and I was like, what? I never hit balls for more than 20 minutes. Like, what am I going to do for three hours? Like, how are we going to do this? And um, I found that the solution for me was, I, I honestly practiced my short game like two and a half hours. Um, and maybe that's why I always had a good short game and I wasn't that good of a ball striker. Uh, <laughs> but I found that, um, my, what my dad used to say to me was, there, he would say to me, it doesn't matter how hard you practice your long game. You will never be as good as some of these other players. You will, it does not matter how many hours you spend on the range, you will never hit the ball the way Tiger Woods does. But there's no reason you can't be a better putter and chipper than him. And I thought, I kind of really took that to heart. Um, and I do think it's true. Um, you know, some people say there's certain advantages maybe men do have in the short game, even over women. Um, but I, I really took that to heart and I thought, that is the part of the game that you can kind of like control the most. And, um, and I found it to just be, I mean, that's truly the only reason I was able to become a pro, was because of my short game. Um, I'm still not a good ball striker, and I never really was. Even when I won the US Open, even that week, I hit just a ridiculously low amount of greens. Um, so I think it just goes to show you that the short game is the most important part. And in terms of, gosh, how do you practice your short game for two and a half hours? That sounds horrible. Are you just standing over putts that whole time? Or, um, my coach would make it really fun, so the fact that you're on a team is, is awesome for that versus just an individual trying to go out and, and practice these things, but doing a lot of drills with your teammates, um, we would do things like we'd pick a 20-foot putt back and forth at two different holes, and a teammate and I would just sit there until one of us made it, and then we switch, and you just keep doing it. So it's like whoever can make it faster, and then you're switching, so that way you're doing like a right-to-left putt and a left-to-right putt. We'd vary the distance. Um, tons of different short game drills um, that my coach had come up with. Um, you know, we'd have it documented on paper, trying to keep track of how well we had done with them, but you truly had to make it structured um, in order to make it fun almost, because if you just go out there with a, I'm gonna practice X amount of time, you're gonna get bored out of your mind and you're really not gonna do your game that much good. So just being, um, try to make it fun, try to make games out of it, figure out some drills, um, with some teammates to do, and, and that's kind of the way that, that I found it to be fun and to get through it. <laughs> I think, Tom, why don't we make this the last question, Tom? Okay, thank you, Hillary. This has really been interesting. And uh, by the way, I'm one of Tim's golf buddies. And oh, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of good ball strikers, he's a very good ball striker. Oh, but, yeah. I'll pay you but, later. Thank you. But <laughs> <laughs> if you actually putt good for the six holes, that's very unusual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I hope that's not your whole question. <laughs> <laughs> so my question really, though, is, is um, as you were making the determination about to continue your career or retire, mm -hmm. tell me what role, if, if any, your, your faith played into that decision. Um, yeah, when I was making the decision to kind of transition out of golf, it was a hard decision because um, golf had been basically the main thing of, of my life at that point for, um, you know, ten, 10 years or more. Um, and um, the main reason driving my decision was we had had uh, one of our daughters at that point. And I was just finding it so difficult to travel with her, just the logistics of traveling with her, um, being either being apart from my husband and, and keeping her from him, or she had to stay home with him and then I don't get to see her. Um, and I didn't like you know, him being home alone and me flying alone. Nothing was just really working out. And we had tried it kind of a number of different ways. And I was just finding um, kind of my my heart wasn't in it. I was starting to resent golf a little bit, that it was like taking me away from my family. 
Um, and I kind of thought I could do it part time. I kind of had this mindset of, well, I'll just sort of play 10 tournaments and then that'll be a good fit. I'll still kind of get my golf. But I kind of quickly found out that you really can't play golf part time. Um, I mean, you can cut your tournaments in half, but it doesn't change the fact that you need to be on your game <laughs> when you do go to those tournaments. So it's not like you can just sit for three months and then show up at a tournament. So. Um, you know, I was going to need to find so much care for our daughter, and I, it just, I wasn't, I was feeling so torn, and so um, it was a hard decision, though, um, and I, the role that my faith played in it was um, obviously just praying about it, um, and starting to feel my heart being led more and more out of it. Uh, it was a gradual thing. I, I still, when I finally kind of made the decision, it was like heart-wrenching, um, like, am I, you know, really going to stop? How can I stop? And how can I walk away from this? But um, I felt more and more that God was leading me, that, that kind of being with my daughter at that point was, was kind of the call that he had for me. And then I quickly got pregnant after that with our second one. And then I was like, okay, yeah, I'm done. I <laughs> cool. guess that's the end of that. So. All right. Um, Hillary's going to stick around. For a while, and again, thank you all for coming out for this. Uh, before we walk down the aisle, not <laughs> not in that way. Um, we have a little gift for you, Hillary, which is a, a granite plaque, which simply says, "With thanks to Hillary Lunky for bringing faith to life." Oh, and thank, we thank you. Thank you very, very much for being thank with you. us. Thank you. Yeah, thank I enjoyed you. it. <laughs>